I'd like to welcome everyone to the Committee of the Hall. It's June the 8th. It's 9 a.m. And at this time, I will entertain to um, a motion to accept the consent calendar. Motion Motion was made by Mr. Suddeth and seconded by Mr. Sailors. All in favor, please address by saying aye. aye. All opposed, and the motion carries. So at this time, I will ask if Ms. Goodwin Caldwell would be so kind as to chair the instructional uh, 2.01. Thank you, Ms. Lavinitz Wells. Yes, um, The instruction section of the agenda on 2.01, the history and mission of Roper Mountain Science Center. Um, Dr. Ross, do you have anything? Yes, ma'am. Good, good morning. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Uh We have this presentation today. Uh, Dr. McDavid and Mr. Weeks are going to share with you all a little bit of the history and the mission of Roper Mountain. Uh, you all discussed uh, a few weeks ago the, the naming of some facilities there, and obviously there has been a an ad hoc, hoc committee formed to further explore uh, the naming of portions of Roper Mountain. And as you all were having that discussion, it occurred to me that there are probably a number of board members that perhaps are more familiar with Roper Mountain than other board members are. So we thought that this would be a good opportunity following on the heels of that discussion before you make some decisions down the road about that. And following the opening of the new facility at Roper Mountain, to spend a little bit of time this morning looking at how Roper Mountain came to be what its very multifaceted mission is, and I offer an opportunity for you all to ask any questions you might have that would enhance your understanding of what they do on the mountain and how meaningful that is, not just to students of Greenville County, the students throughout the state of South Carolina, and for teachers and educators throughout the state of South Carolina. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. McDavid and Mr. Weeks. Good morning, and thank you so much for this opportunity to share more about the Roper Mountain Science Center. Mr. Weeks is going to begin. Good morning. Good to see all of you and be, be back up here to share about Roper Mountain. I think the last time I was up here was when we were talking strategic plans, so it's an exciting to share an update of where we've gone since, since that time. So we take our mission uh, very seriously. This was created as part of the strategic plan, and it kind of guides everything that we do at the mountain to ignite natural curiosity of learners to explore and shape their world. And Rover Mountain, as you know, is really a unique facility. It's unique here in the state and it's unique nationally. There are, there's an association of science and technology centers, ASTC, and uh, there are over 300 different science centers in the, in the world that are members. And there are only very, there are a handful that even have any kind of school district affiliation, let alone our own and operated by a school district on a 62 acre campus with all of the unique resources from the planetarium and telescope to Harrison Hall with all the animals, Sims Hall of Science, and now our new environmental science and sustainability building. So it's really a unique thing that we have here in Greenville that we should really just share with everybody. And we, we have folks who come visit us from all over the United States, especially during our summer programming, and are just amazed that Greenville County Schools has this resource that so many students and the public are able to access. So uh, a quick overview of the history of the Science Center. 
Uh, going back to 1967, it was purchased for the tricentennial project. So uh, the 300 year celebration in 1970 for the state. There were three sites, one down in Charleston at Charlestown Landing, another in Columbia, and the third was for the upstate was at Roper Mountain. The name of the project was the Piedmont Expo Center and it opened very briefly uh, for a few days and it had a unique design by Buckminster Fuller of a, of a geodesic cube sitting on its point at the top of the mountain. And if you're ever up there right behind the conference center, you can see the jagged foundation that's left from that project, which is, which is pretty cool that we still have that. Um, so that project ultimately was not very successful and the uh, parks and PRT offered the uh, location to multiple entities, ultimately Greenville County Schools accepted it with the provision of, of creating an environmental science center. So that was 1974. Um, fast forward a little bit, an amphitheater was, was added, which is uh, no longer there. That's where we have cited the new building. And then the horticulture building, which opened in 1982, was originally used for the horticulture, excuse me, horticulture program, which then moved over to Golden Strip and then became operated by the Science Center after that. In 1985, it officially opened. And as you can see down there, if uh, some of you may know Minor Shaw, um, her, she and, and her family and their foundation were very invo involved in the early years. They're still involved, but um, she was the first president of the Roper Mountain Science Center Association, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a minute. There are a couple of photos of the grand opening. The one on the left hand side, uh, that tunnel still exists when you're approaching Sims Hall. Uh, the planetarium is up on the right hand side. That tunnel is still there so you can see it. And then you can see on the, on the photo on the right hand side, the jagged looking um, concrete foundation that, that still remains at the Science Center. So just a fun photo from the opening day. Didn't last long. So then uh, after 1985, Daryl Harrison was the director at that time, and uh, they really made big strides with the strategic plan for the Science Center. Uh, the Open the Observatory, Daniel Observatory, Sims Hall of Science, 88, Cooper Planetarium, 1990. You'll note that all of those buildings have namesakes uh, related to either the um, donor who gave the bulk of the, the funding for those, or to, uh, in Cooper's case, he was the primary fundraiser for a lot of these, um, as well as a donor. In 1993, the Science Plus Institute began, thanks to um, some members of the legislature, and that continues today. It's a great program. We'll talk a little bit about that later. In 2002, we added the Conference Center, as named for David Wilkins, who was the Speaker of the House at that time. The funds for that came from the state. And then we have had a number of renovations. We're highlighting the Harrison Hall renovation in 2017. And then you can see our groundbreaking for the new building there. So talking about all these buildings, the how did they come to be? The, the Rope Mountain Science Center is a great example of a public-private partnership. So the Rope Mountain Science Center Association, and I want to recognize Caroline Stewart back over here. Caroline is our treasurer. It's a, it's a board who comes alongside the Science Center and the school district and does a lot of the fundraising, the advocacy, and volunteerism. And they work hard, um, not only in the early days to get Rope Mountain going, but that work continues today. So we are appreciative, appreciative of all their work. It was, uh, the association was approved, you can see in 1983, by the school board. Um, the association, school board, and district leadership worked to lay out a master plan for the center for those early years. Um, we have the opening, and then the bulk of that master plan was, was accomplished by 1990. All of the funds for those buildings and the master plan projects was fundraised for and raised by the Rope Mountain Science Center Association. And then after the construction of the buildings, they were turned over to Greenville County Schools to operate and maintain them. So from that 83 to 2018, the association had raised more than $11.5 million to construct the buildings and to support programs at the center. And you can see there are a number of, that's not an exhaustive list, that's just a number of the key donors, particularly in the early years of the center. Uh, so as I said, was this, the buildings were turned over to the district and the district has invested a lot in the, in the science center over the past decade. 
Uh, we started with uh, Sims Hall of Science, which is up at the top of the mountain there. It's where we do a lot of our robotics, physical science, chemistry, um, $2 million renovation there. The Hooper Planetarium had a renovation right before the big eclipse. If you remember the eclipse in 2017, we were able to sneak that re renovation in just in the nick of time so that we could open up with a 4K projection system. And uh, if you recall, that eclipse was a big deal. We had sold out shows for the entire year and it was a great, great time. And then in 2018, a, a great renovation of Harrison Hall, which is the building with all the animals in it. So uh, for those of you who haven't been to the mountain, just a, a quick run through of what we do in the different different areas. So Sims Hall of Science, that's the one up at the top. This is where we do a lot of our, our you know, traditional STEM physics, chemistry and robotics type programming. In addition, we have a large auditorium that seats about 300 where we can do big stage demonstration shows. Think Mr. Wizard, Bill Nye, the science guy, big demos, um, which are very popular. We also bring in different speakers, astronauts, folks from, from all over in that location. Harrison Hall of Natural Science is down at the bottom of the mountain. This is the former horticulture center from the history slideshow. And uh, it really got a great renovation a few years ago, but this is where animals come alive. This is the popular thing here is we have over a hundred different animals. We have an animal caretaker who cares for all of those and a number of volunteers who work with them. That's a great way for us to engage with high schoolers in particular who are interested in that potential career path. And uh, Harrison Hall of Natural Science has a marine lab and a lot of unique resources like the rainforest that you just can't find elsewhere. Back up to the top of the mountain, we have our Daniel Observatory, which has a very historic um, Alvin Clark refractor telescope, which is the eighth largest in North America. Again, folks come from all over the country just to visit this telescope, and especially in the astronomy circles. It has a a neat history to it. Its nickname is the War of the Worlds Telescope because when the War of the Worlds broadcast went out over the airwaves, uh, this was at Princeton University at that time, and the people went to this telescope to look to see if we were actually being invaded by Martians. So, which of course we weren't. But um, it's also likely that Einstein used this telescope. We don't have a photo of it, but if somebody has some good skills, we could make a photo of it. But it's definitely likely. <laughs> that he did use this telescope because he was there at the same time that this was at Princeton. Cooper Planetarium, as I said before, just had a, a great upgrade. It's a 4K state-of-the-art projection system. It was the largest in the state until Columbia built theirs a couple feet bigger than ours, so they could claim that, but ours has more seats than theirs does. And then we have a uh, living history farm, which again, among science centers, we talked about how we're unique in being owned and operated by a school district. Having a li living history farm also makes us very unique. So this is where social studies and history really comes to life with a dozen different historic cabins, with the gardens, the farm animals, and then the costumed um, educators and, and volunteers that help in that area. So why is it important? Well, uh, research shows that informal science learning, so learning outside of traditional classrooms, can be a major predictor to educational achievement. Also, it shapes the attitudes towards science careers, um, which are primarily formed out of school time and in those early ad adolescence years. And uh, according to this study, it appears to be the single most important factor in determining children's future career choices in science. So when they come to the center and they see science in a completely different way and it's brought to life and they're immersed in it, it can really change um, the trajectory of some of our students. Um, interest and motivation for science learning in middle school years in particular is an important predictor of their later career and education choices, which is a big reason why middle school is part of the focus for one of the, one of the primary focus for the new construction, the new building that was just opened. And then informal educational experiences in childhood significantly improve science understanding among populations that are typically underrepresented in science. And because Roper Mountain is free for all of our Greenville County students, that means all of our students get to come there. And um, that is very unique among science centers. At a, at a lot of science centers across the country, there's a fee associated with it, which is a limiting factor to who gets to access it. But at Roper Mountain, we literally get to see all of our students, which is awesome. So um, a little bit about the buildings, a little bit about why it's important now to get into, we could have all these great buildings, but if what we did in the buildings wasn't great, 
it wouldn't, it wouldn't really matter as much. So what got, has guided us and what we're about to roll into our next one is this strategic plan. And all of our decisions for the past six, seven years have, have gone back to this strategic plan and highlighted the, the um, main areas which align with the school district strategic plan that you can see. We also have a facility section because of the unique nature of Roper Mountain. It's not just embedded in the environment. So um, that strategic plan has led to uh, growth over the past six years, and you can see some of the impressive numbers here. This is obviously pre-pandemic, which we uh, we have numbers from this past this past year, which I'll share later. But the field trips to Roper Mountain, so those are during the week, Monday through Friday, September through May, when we have all of our students coming, pulling up at Roper Mountain in their bus, getting off and going to one of those different locations that we highlighted before, spending the day with us doing hands-on immersive science learning. So you can see 47,116 students. In addition, we beam out from the mountain through our virtual field trips. Those go not just to Greenville, it's free for everybody in Greenville and South Carolina, um, but those also go all over the country. And uh, you can see another 9,800 there. And then we have outreach programs, which is our Science on Wheels, our Blast After School program, our Roper Rangers, 21,000 there. And then Science Plus, which is the institute that we have during the summertime where teachers from all over the state come to the center and do a week long class with us, go back to their classrooms with $1,000 worth of materials, um, another 500 plus every summer. <clears throat> so what does that look like? Um, when we have about 50,000 students in our, in our lands, in our classes, you can see a couple of photos of them there. Those are hands-on experiences that utilize the new unique resources and unique locations around, around the mountain. They are um, multiple different grade levels, but our real focus is second grade through eighth grade. There are over 70 different on-site lessons and labs and experiences, and we really focus in on the science and social studies curriculum and support what is going on in the, in the schools. And this is just a sampling of some of the different labs surviving in the wild, obviously is an animal lab, weather is an important second grade indicator. Pollinator engineers is a really neat one that utilizes the hive that we have the beehive in the ecology lab and uh, is a design challenge where students have to um, take their knowledge and create with with their knowledge the marine exploration takes place down in the in the marine lab and you can go through the different ones as of um, putting this together the sixth seventh and eighth grade those all took place at the top of the mountain based on the um, the size of the buildings, the classrooms, and the layout. So what's exciting is with the new building coming online, we'll be adding more 6th, 7th, 8th grade programming that'll take place down in the new building. But that, again, is just a sampling of the many things we do. We have an educator directory that goes to teachers every August. They get to choose what they do when they come. So if they really um, need more help in perhaps uh, physical science, they can focus in on that. If they need help in the natural sciences, they can focus in on that for their for their lessons. So what uh, what do teachers say? This is, we send a survey to every teacher who who comes to the mountain, a Google survey, and we monitor those and adjust our lessons accordingly based on the feedback. And you can see some of the great comments. Um, you know, even things like saying that. From year to year, we improve the lesson. So this was a good program in its old format, but now it is terrific. So that continuous improvement is very much a part of what we what we do as well with our with our lessons. But uh, the science center is not just for Greenville County Schools. We also open it up to to any other uh, Greenville County Schools gets priority, but we open it up to public, private homeschool, um, charter, and then to the rest of the state. So you can see here by the map we have. 45 different school districts come, 23 different counties, three different states. So a lot of different folks come through that mountain. And of that number of about 50,000 students, approximately 70% of the 50,000 are Greenville County students. The other 30% represent the map here. Going to the outreach. So what I was just talking about was every everybody who comes to us on the mountain. This is when we go out with our science on wheels last and virtual field trips 
So we see about another 30,000 students really able to extend the reach, extend the impact of Roper Mountain with the different formats that we do going out to the schools. And then a new initiative that we had just uh, had just started, we didn't weren't able to do it this year with the pandemic, but we'll get back to doing it again this year, hopefully, is Roper Rangers, which is an after school science club where we go to the schools and transportation can be a challenge for some of our students to get to the mountain for after school programming. So this program, we take it to the schools and um, that was a great, great um, success this past year. The Science Plus program I touched on before, but it is funded by the state. Um, so every public school teacher in the state can come absolutely free. Um, it's funded by the EIA and the EOC oversees it. And like I said, about $1,000 of supplies goes back to the schools with those teachers, which is amazing for some of the um, other counties around the state that don't have the resources that Greenville has. Those teachers are really, um, it's, it's a game changer for them to go back to their classroom with that. This past year, uh, we did not have students on the mountain for obvious reasons. So our staff quickly pivoted and created more than 60 different new and dynamic um, live from Roper programs, virtual programs. And those were attended by the virtual school, by brick and mortar schools. And then they are also opened up uh, across the state and across the country for the any extra slots that we had. And we did have people from all over take, take us up on those. So it enabled us to reach more because we could have multiple contacts with kids. So over 109,000 um, students participated in those. And because it was so popular and well received by the teachers and we got a lot of people, especially the fourth quarter, a lot of teachers emailing us saying this was so awesome this year. We love multiple visits to Roper Mountain. Can you keep it going? So our, we do plan next year, in addition to what we're doing with on-site field trips to continue a form of the live from Roper format to, su to support the uh, schools moving forward. So in addition to what we do for schools, we also open the Science Center up to the public and we have um, a program, a long standing program called Second Saturdays that you can see there. The Butterfly Adventure is a new program that came about out of our strategic plan of utilizing the summer time for more public access to the mountain. And we took the rainforest, released uh, a bunch of butterflies and it was very popular. We put that on, on the shelf this year because of the new building. Laser light shows, um, Friday Starry Nights in the Planetarium, which is pretty much every Friday except for um, breaks. We are open the Planetarium up and uh, the observatory as well to the public for shows and for night nightly sky viewings. And then we have our summer camps, very popular summer camps, which are fee-based ones um, that fill up pretty quickly. This year with the new building, we have also added an outdoor dinosaur trail. And so we've taken the butterfly adventure and we've expanded it to the whole summer. So this will be the first time that the public has had this amount of access to Roper Mountain. We are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 o'clock to four o'clock. Our staff is, um, you know, in the buildings, interacting with the with the visitors. And so we already opened this past week, June 1st, we opened and uh, have already had a great response. People from all over, I talked to somebody from um, New York last week, somebody from California, somebody from Virginia. So a lot of people are finding Greenville and in turn finding Roper Mountain and are loving the experience. So that encompasses basically the bottom, geographically the bottom part of the mountain, the new building, the Harrison Hall of Natural Science and the Living History Farm. So looking to the future, there is, our, our new environmental science and sustainability building from the from the back side of the building. There's a good look at the inside. The the themes of this building, and we did a lot of design charrettes. Some of the folks in this room participated in those leading up to the building. And what we the feedback we got from teachers, from educators, from the community was uh, for Rope Round to expand the middle school programming, but really dial it in, uh, focus on water the environment and sustainability. So those are the main themes you see throughout the building. And um, it, it again is probably the most 
immersive space that we have now in that we kind of intertwine the exhibit G throughout the, the common areas. The classrooms, we also in the upstairs classrooms put the stitch projection in so that we can change the atmosphere, the immersion for the students based on whatever it is that we are we are teaching. And like I said before, it enables us to expand in particular the focus for middle school programming. There's a picture from the, the gala um, that we had. And how will it allow us to broaden our impact? So within three years, we estimate that we'll see another 15,000 students, which is about a 30% increase. And a reminder that about half the kids who come, us, come to us are on poverty index. Uh, it enables us to create these new programs that focus on middle school, which will increase the, increase the participation by about 30% there. And then with the expanded access outside of school hours, we expect a boost in participation by members and by the public by another 25% to encourage that lifelong and multi-generational learning. In addition, it'll enable us to enlarge teacher professional development programs. We have a new Science Plus class that we're doing this year in the new building that is going to be focused on uh, first and second and third year teachers for to help with teacher retention. It's going to be a commitment where they'll commit to coming to the class, not just this year, but next year as well to build a real cohort. Um, we are partnering with special ed and with fans in order to host a culinary employability credential and school based business enterprise program. Um, and this is this is awesome. We already have some students that are going to be with us this summer. And uh, I was talking to one of them yesterday who is super excited to be in this building because it's new. And then she's already has a job to work at Fountain Inn, which is also new in the fall. And so she was pretty excited to get to get to be in these places. And she reminded me that she's going to be getting paid to do it. So um, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then uh, after school programming expansion and during all of this running up to the building, we developed a number of sustainability lesson, lessons in collaboration with Furman's Shy Center for Sustainability. So we worked with the students there, we worked with the professors there, and have some offerings that will be included in our lessons on site, as well as pre and post for our teachers to access. And um, this building is unique in that it features more exhibits than the other parts of the Science Center. Those exhibits are the Nature Exchange and Habitat Walkthrough in the Orientation Area, which is the picture there on the bottom left, and then Our Water Story, which is the picture there on the, on the right, and then a Sustainable Future exhibit. So those are permanent installations that take up about 4,000 square foot of the building. And it's thanks to the Roper Mountain Science Center Association um, who have de uh, developed and executed the Doing Big Things on a Little Mountain capital campaign that they've already raised about $3 million to fund these exhibits. And their goal is to raise about another million dollars. So um, going back to our strategic plan, we, we use our mission to guide our, our daily happenings at the mountain, but this is our vision, which is kind of how we what we're striving for for the for the future and what our strategic decisions are made based on this. So to be a pinnacle of innovative innovative learning, engine for community engagement and national leader in science education. And uh, I can say that with this new building and with the new programs that we've been doing, we are, are definitely striving and um, reaching some of these some of this vision. So um, that's all I had for everybody today. Thank you. And did we have any any questions? Sure. Thank you for that presentation. You've got a lot of good programs going on. Thank you. And, uh, um, do I have any questions? Okay. Roger Meek. <laughs> Hey, Brett. Um, <clears throat> could you tell me a little more about the Roper Rangers? Absolutely. Uh, that was an intentional program to uh, look at engaging kids who are at Title I schools who might not have a science club at their school. And so we reached out to some of the principals to find out if they had a, a club of their own. And if they didn't, then we took one of our 
uh, education staff and they went out to the school, met with, uh, I forget what the exact schedule was, but say Tuesdays at Cherrydale for six consecutive weeks. And so each week they did a different kind of theme to it. It was focused on um, third or fourth, third and fourth or fourth and fifth graders. And they, it was, so it was the same group of kids typically, and they got to do, we brought the lesson in, brought the, I know one time they did um, fossils and minerals. So he brought in all these fossils and minerals. They got to sort, they got to keep some of them, which they thought was awesome. And then another week they did like kitchen chemistry. So it was a lot of hands-on science, fun science, not necessarily, you know, just straight on the standard, but it was more to enhance it and get them excited about science. Did a little bit on career paths, just get them to start thinking about, you know, if you like this, this is something you can do with it. And so it was, um, it was very well received and something like after the pandemic that we, we intend to um, get going again. Well, this is after school. This is after school. Yeah. So those students who are interested, so the, the homeschool identified the students and I think it was, um, I think 16 approximately students. And so they would stay a little bit late and it would run from like 2.30 to 3.45, something about that time frame. And these Title, sorry, these Title I schools also had pre-existing after-school programs from which they could pull students who were interested. So transportation was already being provided for the students, but we could pull the students out that one day of their after-school program into some specialized programming. Um, also with the Title I funds, a lot of the materials were consumable, make and take, that the students could go home and extend their learning. So the schools were able to help support, along with some district funding, the materials that went home with students. So that six weeks per school and those Title I schools to enhance the experience. Great. Can you explain to me the transportation piece of it? The, for example, Montevideo has an after-school program and the students are already there four days to five days per week in the schools. They are there from three until five. The bus takes them home because they're in an after-school program anyway. The school principal, the team, looks at the students who project or select 16 students who would be determined or deemed Roper or Rangers. And so they're already there every day for the after-school program. The bus, they simply get on the same bus they go home on every other day of the week in the after-school program. So if their program was Tuesdays and Thursdays, like at Cherrydale, um, they may have a Thursday Roper Ranger. So 16 selected students would participate in Roper Rangers and they would get back on the bus that would ordinarily ride. So the students that are already in the after-school program, you pick 16 of those students and they get into the Roper Rangers. Or the school could also select students who are not in the after-school program to join on that Tuesday or that Thursday afternoon to participate, and they would add them to the bus route to go home because the transportation would be prohibitive for them to get picked up after school. So we just make sure that's all covered. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Meek. I didn't get everybody's hand. Can y'all raise your hand again if you have questions? Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Mosley. Thank you, sir. I can't hear. Okay. Is your speaker yeah. on, Ms. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Um, oh, gosh. To be squeaky. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's very interesting. Yeah, let me see. Is that better? Here we go. Um, that's I heard several things. Glad we're expanding uh, to reach more middle school students, but I really like the special education uh, partnership with the culinary aspect. I think I heard you say with the animal care lab or whatever you're calling that, the care chair, there's, there was an opportunity, something about high school students being involved. Could, could you elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. So the, uh, because of the nature of, we, we have a lot of volunteers at the mountain uh, in the summer times in particular, and they can volunteer with the, the summer adventure that I referenced. They can volunteer with the summer camps. Um, and, but because those aren't always, those run primarily in summertime, they're not necessarily available during the school year. So one of the main ways for high schoolers to volunteer at the mountain during the school year is to be part of the animal care 
um, program. So those are students typically who come after school and are transported by their parents or their you know, sibling or whomever. And they come to the mountain and they work closely with our animal care taker to learn about taking care of um, the animals, taking care of the tanks, doing the water changes, all, all of those different pieces of what it takes to keep all, over 100 different animals healthy. And so those students typically are interested in maybe veterinary or environmental science or some kind of animal care type career path. And um, but that's so that's a year round way that we in, engage with high schoolers because high school classes don't come to the mountain on, on field trips. So that's a way that we can engage with them. So how do they is that something they apply to do through Rubber Mountain, or is that something that each school offers? That is something that they apply to Rubber Mountain, and then they have to go through through a training and a kind of a, a vetting process as part of it, and then they get plugged into the schedule and work directly with the animal caretaker. Okay. There, there are also animal care programs in some of the high schools that mostly do it. Mr. Weeks wouldn't necessarily know that. Uh, Jeff may recall, I know Hillcrest, and I think there might be one other. Uh, Mr. Williams is not in here, but he's probably listening. Uh, there's an animal, small animal care program that is part of their ag program. So I suspect that some, probably not all, but some of the students that come to the program at Rupper Mountain are in the animal care program at Hillcrest. Uh, some of those students are also placed uh, and work locally in some uh, vet offices and uh, animal grooming businesses and that sort of thing. Okay, so just a point of clarification. It sounds like they have to, if, if they're involved in this, they provide their own transportation. This is not something that we provide. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> This is squeaky. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Ms. Good and Call. This is a great presentation, and I'm I'm just so excited about the new facility and everything that you guys have been able to do. Can you can you talk just a little bit about the budget for the Rock Mountain Science Center? Because I know not all of it comes from district funds. So can, can you just give a kind of a general breakdown in a typical year? This has not been a typical year. Kind of how is how how is the Rupert Mountain Science Center generally funded? So on a, on a high level, we um, you know the school district owns and operates the center, which means my salary, um, my teaching staff, custodial staff, support staff. Um, those are school district employees, and then in addition to that, we supplement our um, district baseline with um, local funds. So those are funds that we generate from some of the some of the things that I pointed out in the presentation, like the um, public programs, the summer camps are very popular and revenue generator memberships to the Science Center. So folks who become a member of Rope Mountain, they get to come to the Friday Starry Nights for free, they get to come to previously Butterfly, now Summer Adventure for free as part of the cost of their membership. And um, in addition, we have the, the Science Center Association, which does fundraising to supplement what we what we can um, do at the mountain. So, uh, on a high level, those are the those are the, the sources of funding. So, in a traditional year, which would, this wasn't, is it 50-50 that's funded through district funds and funded through revenue generated by the on the mountain, or is it? What's what's the general breakdown of those dollars? Uh, the, the majority, um, probably about three quarters, are district provided funds. It's hard to put a hard yep. number on, but and so the, the positions are the same way. They're 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 funded through the district at about seventy five percent, or the uh, the a number of the full time positions are, and then we supplement that by hiring some additional staff so that we can. Um, touch all of the students that we do. So those local funds that we are enabled that we can keep, we can put back into hiring the additional staff that we require to meet those numbers. And the the district uh, this past year didn't do field trips to the Herb Mount Science Center, so all that work was done virtual. Did did other districts do field trips to the Science Center, or no, were there just, no, just no face to face? So so all of that revenue you you didn't collect this year. That's correct. Did did we have did we have any of the other like the Saturdays and things like that? We we did not have any of our public programming. We started 
the Starry Nights back up in uh, April at one third capacity. So how were you guys able to kind of compensate for that that loss of 25% like, of your revenue from, from this year? We're still working with the district to look at how the impact of the loss of revenue for those ongoing programs would impact us moving forward. So that's a conversation we're having with Dr. Worcester and Robin Stack to make sure that we are able to sustain the level of funding and the offer to provide opportunity. So we're still examining that impact. But during this past year, you didn't lay off any employees or reduce any positions? The positions that are serving students, for example, some of the positions that were being funded to serve students coming to the mountain, we were not, we didn't need them because there were no students coming to the mountain. So we did work with our team to look at the staffing and how we could scale that back to make sure that the employees were okay in some cases um, in different places, moved to different places while we did not have students there. But a mountain with no students did not require as many staff members. But, but you plan on being back to 100% staff capacity for this? Absolutely. This, this current fiscal year? Absolutely. Now we, in the last budget, I think we approved an additional position at the Rockmount Science Center. But, but that position, was it, is it one of, what was that position that we, that we approved? For the 40,000. For which budget? Yeah. Um, the, the, um, Dr. Rice, do you want to speak to that? The, I, I just want to clarify, he's, uh, I believe it was the staff about the FY22 budget, which would be the position. Yes, sir. Okay. The 40, yeah, that was the 40,000 to support the new building. And what does that position do? Uh, we haven't filled it yet. Okay. Our, our, we're not at full capacity. We will get students to register to come for these for the programs. Um, over last year, we did have some team members that were pre-existing as well as some that were working with us that we contracted with to build curriculum. But until we get students registered to actually come to the mountain, we don't have the demand as of like August 17th. We don't need to have fully staffed, but we do have a line on who would be working with our students that we could bring in and our demand will help us determine, you know, how often we need them on site at first and that demand will pick up. We're very much at a, we operate in the black, is that what we call it? <laughs> we operate in the, in the black for the most part, the programming, uh, the paid programming and the free programming that we provide for all Greenville County schools, that programming is what keeps us going. So when the increase or the demand increases, that's when we increase the staff members. Our summer staff, we are operating not at full, full capacity this summer, but by next summer, we'll need more people because with the numbers we have come in every week and the number of opportunities, you will need to have extra people, but not every day. So we staff very um, based on need. We staff based on the need for the programs we have, but that position will be filled. Thank you. If, if I'm right to maybe clarify that because yeah, that was a little bit trying to deal with it on a daily basis might have been a little bit confusing. I think we're mixing two things. They've got that position approved and they'll hire somebody for it. And I think Dr. McDavid is also talking about, for lack of a better term, we hire all these adjunct or part-time positions based on the demand on the mount. And those would be the positions we want to hire back because they align with people coming on the mount. And, that, and those positions would go up and down. I think, Michael, over a number of years, they go up and down based on the demand for the positions and the revenue that's created by the actual trips. That's correct, even seasonally. Which doesn't, yeah, even and seasonally, which doesn't affect their assigned baseline staffing. Their staff, now unlike a school, but their staff like an apartment, so they have FTEs on their baseline. And there are some full-time people that were not needed on the mountain during the period of time it was closed and they were reassigned to other jobs in the district. And as they come back, I guess they're, they're welcome to return to the job that they were in before, but we found work for them to do so they didn't lose their job. And uh, to clarify, Jeff clarified it for me. In addition to Hillcrest, Woodmont and Blue Ridge also have animal care as a part of their ag programs. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, Mr. Suddeth. Mr. Weeks, I'm looking at 
today's science. And everything I've seen at Rope the Mountain is certainly modern kind of not science. I was wondering with the issues that we have today, do we have anything that compares oil and gas with solar and wind? We do. We have uh, up at Sims Hall of Science. I believe it was 2013, we installed an array of 88 solar panels, which not only um, help from the energy standpoint, but we use it in the sixth grade lessons that we do in that building with students. And part of their experience, it's designed all around energy, which is an important sixth grade standard. And they do one lab that deals with wind power, one lab that deals with solar power, and then the third lab deals with electromagnets, but all around energy. What about gas and oil? Uh, gas and oil. Well, in the in the new building, we have some energy exhibits that are um, the student or the visitor uh, right now in the summertime. But the student, they get to design their own city, and they have all of the different choices with the pros and cons, how it uh, has environmental impact, how it can meet demand and the costs of the associated energy sources. So that's coal, that's gas turbine, that's wind, that's solar, and um, probably missing a couple others, but I think there's about six different choices that they have. And then they use real data to make their choices and see how it affects their, their city that they're creating. Well, it seems today that they're talking about eliminating oil and gas and using other means. Are we addressing that at Rupert Mountain? Or do we have it? I'm just wondering, do we have anything that compares to our young people between oil and gas is what wind or solar does? We do in the, in the new building, in, in that exhibit that I was referencing before, it does a really nice job of laying out the differences in a couple of different ways for students to understand that. Yeah. They're going to have to decide or determine sometime in their life which one they have to go for. That's right. What about, is, do we do anything with electric automobiles? We have partners in the community like BMW who will bring them out for their for big event days that we have. Um, we don't have one that lives on the mountain or anything like that, but um, we typically will, will partner with folks to, to, to make that visible. Do we have anything that compares the batteries in electric cars with oil, gas, and oil? Yes, we do not have any exhibit like that now. What about, I know we have the environmental. Do we do any, say anything about global warming? We, uh, we talk about environmental impact. We talk about biodiversity. And we, um, we use the, the data that's out there from NOAA and from um, other, other sources. Um, we don't have a class called global warming or anything like that, but it's, you know, it's certainly part of the, the um, real life discussion about choices with the environment. Well, it seems today there's two schools of thought. And I don't trust either one of those schools of thought. But I would trust our, our science center and at least let them know that yes, there is global warming or no, there's not global warming or here's those people that say there are, people that say they're not. And then how uh, it affects the environment and how it will not affect the environment. I'm, I'm interested in our science center talking about and all the things that we have today in our society where we are really going out and asking. She was like, well, if your decision made, am I going to go with oil? Yes, I'm going to go with the solar wind. And then also, I've heard that by 2030, there'll be no gas cars, they'll all be electric. So I, I wonder how much of the science is involved in that and how how much are we telling our young people, you know, this is what we have. You know all about the gas car, here's an electric car. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we need to compare you know, because one of those is going to be in the future or are they going to share? Mm -hmm. I really do enjoy your program. You really show you one up there. Uh, I look forward to getting some more information on what we're going to do about some of these things that are affecting our society and there's two schools of thought. Sure. What to do. And 
whether we decide to take one over the other or just simply show both and let you make the decision. I would prefer we show the both and let you make the decision. But that does seem to be our way that we work today. And we'll tell you to do it this way or that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutter. Um, I'd like to extend for 15 minutes. Um, Ms. Dillon. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. This is a great presentation. And you know, our family is big fans. We're members and attend programs often. Um, we've already been to Summer Adventures where I will admit publicly, I did lose one of my children. And I turned to my husband and I said, well, I, I don't know where she went, but I, well, was, she must have gone this way or that way. And maybe there's cameras. And he told me there aren't cameras. So I would like to know about security on the mountain. If there are 78,000 students or visitors, it seems like it would be a good thing to have some security there. Yeah, well, I can I can speak to some of that. We uh, we have a security guard at the front gate. Yeah. Uh, I believe any any detail should be shared in the second session. Do we need to wait for executive session? Be just a minute. Am I new or old? Okay. Oh, you're, 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 you're. Dr. Royce is going to respond to that for us. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your indulgence because I think I can now respond to it without you having to go into executive session because to the point made earlier, we don't like to go into details about security in public session, but I think I can answer this. And if you want more detail, we could do that later in executive session because we don't currently have that building in use. There are not cameras yet installed in the new building, but cameras will be installed in the new building. I don't know what the holdup is, but, but they are part of the construction and will be installed there. And it would be inaccurate to say that there are not cameras on the mountain. Now, if we want additional detail as to that, then we need to discuss that in executive session. If that, that perhaps that answered your question. Yeah. Um, my, the only other question was that when last year, when you switched to all virtual programs, was there, were all of those free for anyone that wanted to? Yes, to they were free for anybody, South Carolina or elsewhere. Um, are there grants or was there any CARES Act funding to cover the cost? Uh, transferring all of the programs to be virtual. It was uh, it was essentially just a reallocation of our staff time for for the Greenville part of it, and we did receive grant funding from a corporation to enable us to do some outside of Greenville, and um, Floor funded some of that, and Floor has always been a good partner at the mountain, as well as I believe Lockheed Martin, to enable it to go outside the mountain or outside Greenville, I should say. And then going forward, it, will they always be free for teachers to use in their classrooms throughout the, the whole country? That is uh, that is what we are planning for. And then we would also seek out some additional grants if we wanted to be able to expand it to outside of Greenville as well. Okay, thanks. 
but we reserve the right to charge a fee at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dolan. <laughs> Ms. Wells. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the, the subscription fee model has been very yes. successful. So if you build your brand, then that's where you can go with that. Um, I, I, mean, I love River Mountain, too. There are a lot of people who spend a lot of you know, junk on there. spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears there. Um, to a lot of volunteering, and, and a lot of us just really kind of. Our kids have grown up on the mountain. So we appreciate um, what you guys have done. I guess I am super excited about the opportunity that the new building brings, particularly in light of the pandemic. And what we know has been a huge impact to learning for students and, and not just in their what they've been able to grasp and, and that piece, but even just the motivation there. You know, it's been, it's been the struggle's been real, very real for students not be motivated to learn. So I I would like to see the the completion, if you will, of what we want out of that environmental center in particular to, to be as accelerated as possible so that we can be fully outfitted and fully ready to deliver the the best lessons we can. So can you tell me a little bit about you've got a capital campaign that the association is working on? Can you tell me about some of the things that we still you know, are yet to be funded that we that we need that we really to really have it outfitted to to address these the classroom content we want to provide. Can you give me a little bit of sure. insight on that? So we've kind of worked from the inside out with the uh, with the capital campaign and really focused on um, what was most essential to, to start the programming. And so the bulk of what has been raised by the association has gone towards the exhibits on the inside that, you, that you've seen, the water story, sustainable future, nature exchange and whatnot. Um, what we'd like to do is to do some enhancement to those with some technology, some other um, manipulatives and whatnot, as well as kind of the adjacent spaces around the, the building. So there's a nice space that used to be where the um where santa was you know where the, the butler building where santa was um for holiday lights but we have once once the amphitheater went away and we built this building we found that we had this great space uh which could be an outdoor learning space where we'd like to do a sensory garden we'd like to do some different examples of sustainable housing and um perhaps some other uh, there, are, there are some other ideas for things that could be implemented out there. So that's kind of the next phase is expanding the and connecting that building more um, educationally to Harrison Hall because Harrison Hall is about 400 feet away and we have a path there, but we would like to do some things in between. So because we, we try to make everything an educational experience. So even if you're walking from one building to the other, we want to engage you. So your, your goal on your capital campaign what you've raised and what you are still missing or what you still have to go is remind me of that number. It's a, a little over a million dollars. So so I guess if we have you know, kind of thinking back to what's the impact then to your revenue that Mr. Mr. Lewis was asking about and, and knowing that now you know you've got this great new thing that you're doing with the virtual experiences except the staff members next year that we're doing the virtual now have kids back on the mountain. So I think there are several things in play. So I, I guess, Dr. Royster, if, if as we look at how we're using our, our ESSER funds, if we can be sure that, you know, thinking about the mountain can, you know, with not just the impact, but then how we can kind of accelerate and amplify what they're doing. I know we still don't have K-5 through and first graders there, right? They don't take field trips to the mountain. That's correct. And that was part of um, the strategic planning process that we went through that I referred to. That was a lot of input and from teachers and and um, the community as well as, you know, when we have a finite resources really focusing in on that second through eighth grade target. You think that's going to be the, still be the case, even though now you're going to have a little more room, but we're adding a whole different grade level so the Roper Mountain strategic planning process began 
right before the pandemic, and we'll pull that back together and fold that into the district's strategic plan. So just as that was set forth, as we have more resources available, community input, we will look at expanding the influence. Um, and we can make that determination at that time. I don't think one person would be finite and saying this is what we are are not going to do the strategic planning committee will come together we'll partner and come alongside the district plan but we'll have a next round ready to look at how we expand our opportunities yeah and i think just similarly kids get so excited when they come to the mountain um two of the people that were with me yesterday came up in greenville county schools and they had done field trips there and you know they're engineers so they it, it really does make an impact on students when they can get some hands on and can kind of get excited. And I think then they take that back to their classroom and their school and it can really change how they engage. So um, I think what you're doing is just so important and it is so unique. Um, it's just a bright, a bright light for, for Greenville County Schools, like some of the other things we have that are very unique. So um, thank you for what you're doing and I'll, I'll certainly do my part to help with that fundraising as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wells. Mr. Sailors. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Michael Charlotte, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, this is, uh, I was sitting here doing the math and Lisa brought up blood, sweat, and tears, 25 years worth. I didn't realize until I was sitting here doing the math, Daryl corralled me in 1998. So um, it's been, a, you know, every year we see something exciting. I can remember when uh, what is now the Wilkins Conference Center it used to be a double wide trailer. And so every, every time we go through a cycle, something exciting happens there. And then we look at what's next, the, the next adventure, if you will. Um, the new building has definitely been an adventure. I know that. Uh, before we started this, we never would have thought that we would be able to have a opportunity there where our special education students could work through the Connections Cafe and get job training and also help you with a need because all of your field trips that came before, not only had to bring the children, they had to bring their food with them too. So this helps provide an additional service to the, to the classes that will be coming there. And oh, by the way, you will make a little bit of money in revenue. But uh, when we're talking about that million plus that you still have to address, uh, you do have, I believe, requests for anywhere from two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars with the General Assembly that's currently on the table. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. So, uh, but you do not include that in your budgeting until. Naturally, it's been it's been brought in. Um, when we're talking about science on wheels, uh, you've got one staff member that provides that service with a vehicle and all of the equipment to go to schools. How much does it cost you annually to uh, facilitate that service? Uh, I don't have the exact number, but uh, the the cost the cost for the position is. is when it's one of my baseline positions. And then the so we take some of our district fund allocation to um, get the supplies that we need to, to go out. Um, typically, if we have a new uh, program, and because that, that program has a reach beyond Greenville County Schools, it is one that, that uh, other, um, that people are interested in sponsoring from other counties. So it's a good opportunity for us to if we have an idea for a new program that's going to require some new supplies to go to one of those partners um, that the association has that we can um, sometimes get some grant funding to enable us to expand with some new new programs and the cost that would come with those. Is there enough demand to justify a second position in that service? I would say that once we are able to operate our portable planetarium, which is called Star Lab, then mm -hmm. yes. Um, we haven't been able to operate that because it's a confined space. But uh, once once that is back up and operational, then yes, there's there's more demand than we have for one position. Okay, and you're expecting that to be up on 
up and running August of 21 or early um, school year 21, 22? We, we hope that it will be, but it is going to be determined by the CDC guidelines and where we're at come, come this fall. Okay. Um, there, in our long range facilities plan, so I'm going to spend the Dr. Royster on this one. In our long range facilities plan, we have the incubator and the design phase to go on the nose of the property, if you will. And I know that there's the potential of some high school related instruction that would tie in between the science center and the incubator. Can you fill us in on that? Yeah, we're in, uh, we're in schematic right now to get a finer point on the cost. Um, you know, we put that project on hold for a short period of time, but they're scheduled to be a Kate Innovation Center located. If some of you who have been a part of this for a while will recall Greenville County Rec Commission's headquarters set in the lower parking lot at Roper Mountain. We demoed that facility a number of years ago, and the intent is to put on that piece of property an incubation center for career and technical education. One of the areas that is being discussed as a first, uh, one of the first areas uh, goes to hydrogen cell technology, which I think goes back to Mr. Sutta's question. Now the design, and this will be a part of our CAPE programs responsible to Mr. Williams' office, but co-located at Roper Mountain. So there's also the opportunity there to partner with programs that exist on the mountain. The idea behind that innovation center is to develop new, obviously innovative programs. And as they either gain in popularity or don't, they would either be sent out to the regional career centers or they might be phased out in order to make space for new innovative programs to go there. So hence kind of that term incubation center to incubate programs that we believe might have a future either in uh, two or all four of the career centers, or it may be something we say, well, that there's really not much future that we're going to discontinue that one. So it's being built very much or designed very much in the manner you'll see a lot of cities and counties that build industrial spec buildings that can be adapted for multiple industrial uses. So we're attempting to design that in a manner that it can be adapted for multiple career and technical courses, including some high bay areas and some oversized, but more normal uh, as far as height uh, classrooms. Uh, also, we, we want to be very care careful, and, and those of you that have been on the board a while have heard me say this several times, and I want to take the opportunity to say this now. We want to be really careful about expanding any book building footprints on the mountain so as not to take away from the natural spaces that are up there that are so much a part of the science center as well. So this was this building we project to put down in a space that is not any part of what is being utilized for any aspect of the environmental or natural science part of the mountain. It's going there and kind of in the front of that parking lot, which is uh, adjacent to frontage road uh, that intersects with Roper Mountain Road. So again, we want to be very cautious that we don't take up space on the mountain from a natural aspect to put a building footprint on. Excuse me, Mr. Sailors, how much more time do you need you to know that's one question? Okay, well, we don't need to extend. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, that is the instruction. I just want to make one statement for to Mr. Meeks. Oh, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I, I text you and uh, raised it. Uh, uh, so no, you did. Mr. Weiss, I, I just want to say that the grand opening uh, that was held and the donor recognition at the Environmental Center and Sustainability Center was, was phenomenal. And Minor Nicole Shaw, as well as her husband, Hal, were there and watched from the balcony. And I spoke to them and we went through the history of Roper Mountain. But there were so many people there that have done so much back in the day that are still doing so much today. 
and now everyone else is as well. And it's, it's because of the leadership there. And it's because every one of your staff brings something different to the table. And you all complement each other in making this such an incredible experience for so many of all ages. I played those games and I was trying to put everything in different places, you know, the trash, the bottles, the this and that. There was this one gentleman watching me and I think he was videotaping me and I said, please do not put this on Facebook. <laughs> but it was, it was good and you could control the speed. Mr. Sutter, I think you find that very entertaining, but I think all of us enjoy all of the games at all of the buildings that you have because there's so much for all ages. So I thank you and uh, I, I continue to um, watch over and embrace your leadership and your visionary and creative creativity. So thank you so much. That's all, Ms. Thank you. Madam Chairman, can I make more of a general question? Are there any chance of holiday life return to Rocky Mountain? What did he we say? get that question a lot. Um, there are no plans, no plans for, for holiday life to return to the mountain. <laughs> yeah, all of the displays were sold as part of the, the ending of that program. So we'll just come to your house, Mr. Sutter. So we can't get, well, the only reason I like that because so many people who didn't know about Rocky Mountain go up there at Christmas and say, wow, I never knew they had that. Yeah. It was really a great choice for people to come yes. because they didn't know anything about Rocky Mountain. Yes. So we need to think about getting some more equipment. That, that was actually, so as a reminder, that was actually an effort of Greenville Downtown Rotary and the Association. And I think it became a great challenge for them to staff that. And and I think the, the lighting was aging. Now, I don't want to say the Rotary members were, but I think that we, they, the, the, the lighting was aging and it was more and more difficult to get volunteers to staff it. So they, did, they chose to discontinue it rather than to reinvest in new lighting because they just didn't have the staff to, the volunteer staff to man it. <laughs> Thank you all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin Kawai for chairing. Uh, the instruction section. Uh, now, Mr. Meek, if you would be so kind to uh, chair the administration. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, next item on the agenda, 3.01 SR3 funding plan update. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Mr. Meek. Uh, you have in your board materials just a, considering the requirements inherent in this SR3 that we call it, it's really ARA, uh, as termed by the, the federal government. You have a summary of all the things that we are required to do to develop a spending plan. So I simply provide that to you as information to say to you that through the next several weeks, we will be doing all the things that we're required to do. When you look at it, you about have to ask for input from just about everybody in the community. So we're gonna do that on a broad basis and also with specific groups to let them have a say in how should the district uh, utilize the ESSER funding. So we'll gather that information from them. Uh, we'd also ask, and some of you have already done so, but if you would, between now and our board meeting next week, as you think of things you want to make sure that we look at, like today was Rubber Mountain was mentioned in the past, uh, mental health has been mentioned, uh, career and technical equipment has been mentioned. If you would make sure that you share with me those things you want to make sure that we look at and consider. Uh, there's, there are uh, multiple areas that it can be used for, but the, the caution we always have to come back to is we're looking at non-recurring funds. So we'll be cautious in this application to recurring expenses. 
Uh, we did get some good news on Friday afternoon. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education clarified, or the U.S. Secretary clarified their directions about this June, does August the 24th deadline. There are two deadlines in SR3 or ARA. One is for a reopening plan. It is hard and fast June the 24th. We already have a reopening plan because we've already reopened. But there are points we have to hit that are required as a review of that reopening plan. And we'll be doing those things so we can update that plan to comply with the requirements by June the 24th. Now, the spending plan, which is a separate plan, was originally communicated through the State Department that that must be done by August the 24th. Well, as you all know, there could not be a worse time to try to get anybody's input and develop anything than, the, than right at the end of school <coughs> through the beginning of school. So uh, I don't know all the organizations that address this with the secretary, but AASA, which is the superintendent's group, and the large districts consortium of which we are a member, went in writing to the secretary and asked them to consider and to clarify for states that that deadline of August 24th is not hard and fast and may be extended. And we were informed late Friday afternoon that the secretary was issuing that clarification. So that should reduce our crunch time on getting anything related to ESSER 3 as far as a plan by August the 24th. He also clarified to SEAs, to state education agencies, that anything you put in that plan, you can subsequently amend, just like we can do other federal programs. We can amend it after we submitted it and change the funding around within the plan as long as it complies with the 14 areas, Robin, 15 areas. There's multiple different areas in ESSER 1, 2, and 3. Like one, was 112, 114, and 115, does that sound right? But it, anyway, it basically covers about anything that you would want to do. So that's simply an update to you, but it would also be most helpful if you would let me know your thinking between now and next Tuesday. So we'll be sure that we have considered that and folded this into what we're doing. You all have already approved us utilizing uh, the required amount of ESSER 3, which is 20% for academic remediation. Now, we will not be able to spend that until we have an approved ESSER 3 plan, but that's okay because we have ESSER 2 funds set aside to utilize until we have the approved plan and we can tap into the ESSER 3 because the ESSER 3, 20% required does not quite reach the total amount that we needed anyway. The other thing that we will be doing is any legitimate charge that could be made to ESSER 1 or 2 before the end of this fiscal year, we will journal entry already approved budgetary expenses and use those funds to fund those expenses that you all had already approved in the general fund budget, which will then move that money to your fund balance considerations for the fall. And it looks like that might be around $40 million. Now, again, fund balance considerations, there are not even the 15 uh, required areas. So when you go to look at that and we bring you recommendations, that could be utilized as any other fund balance amount generated through the general fund fund balance can be used. So that just kind of a little bit of an update on where we are. Some of the things that we'll be doing and some of the things you'll see in here in the next several weeks have to do with making sure we've complied with all these various requirements in order to properly frame uh, and meet the requirements of the reopening plan due on June the 24th. And the yet to be, I will say now, yet to be determined deadline for ARA or ESSER 3 funding, which would be no earlier than August the 24th, but likely now will be extended. What we've not yet received is direction from the State Department 
that they have received that clarification from the secretary's office, and as such, they're going to extend the deadline. There would be no reason for them not to do that. In fact, they've planned technical assistance meetings for school districts in July uh, to to help districts write their plans. So that there, there there should seem to me to be no reason the state would not extend the deadline in accord with the secretary's latest instructions regarding that. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, Dr. Well, Roster, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Mosley. Thank you so much, Dr. Royster. I'm going to try to ask this question as logically as I can, make sure I understood you correctly. Um, and I think I think there is some confusion on my part. So, for example, it sounds like what is required by ESSER for this safe return in-person instruction. If I heard you say there are certain points that have to be addressed or certain requirements that, can you elaborate on, just give me some examples on that because that might answer my second question. For example, you have to get uh, community or parental input on your reopening plan. Well, we had it on the front end of it, but if you've already reopened, they require you to, uh, let's try to think of the best term for it. Do like a follow up or a check in with the committee. Yeah, so we're working on doing that. Now. Okay. Which I think that does answer what I've already heard was solicitation of some parent input. And so I guess I was a little confused because as you can imagine, as elected officials, we get a lot of questions and a lot of folks are sitting out there trying to read the tea leaves of what's going on. And there is a lot of misunderstanding when a, a call has been put out to maybe have parent input or staff or whatever input to uh, for a reopening plan when technically we're already reopened. I keep hearing you say we're moving ahead full, you know, full steam ahead. We're planning for normal in-person instruction. <clears throat> when those types of things are solicited, it sounds like maybe we're backtracking a little bit, or at least that's the interpretation. And so I get a lot of concern questions and stuff. So I'm just making sure I'm clear on, on the fact that this seems to be a, sort of a, we have to check the box on some of these things as part of ESSER's requirement for yes. us, correct? Okay, yes. is that the, I mean, I'm trying not saying it correctly, but. We've not made some hard and fast uh, public announcement about what next fall looks like. We right. anticipate doing that very shortly, okay. by the end of the month. I think you can tell by looking at what we're doing in summer school, but there's some protocols in place, but they're very few. Uh, buildings are reopened, for example, this building's reopened to the public now uh not, not just the meeting today but in general we have the public uh schools are reverting back to uh having expanded visitors or volunteers and there's some volunteers in the spring uh now it's still at the principal's discretion as it always has been but it's not disruptive to the instructional program or where it adds to the instructional program uh we, we're still continuing to work on our virtual program for next year we have some concerns about uh, the funding from the state being capped. Uh, you know, when we when we say on one when we say on one hand that we want to encourage choice, and we have the largest choice program of any school district in this state, and one of the largest ones in the country, uh, to think that there's the potential that we that our district could be financially penalized for offering choice to parents. Uh, obviously, we're very much against that. Uh, so we're trying to get that. Uh, uh, information to our legislators so that we hope that they will act accordingly when they consider that proviso that's currently before the General Assembly to to cap, I believe, at uh, 10 percent uh, the the enrollment in in virtual programming. You know, in our opinion, there there should be no cap on that based on the availability of space and and really the availability of virtual space is unlike a school is essentially unlimited. Now we get too far into the school year, the limitation wouldn't be space, it would be staffing. So we want to try to get that resolved by the end of this month. But there will be a number of things that we must do in order to comply. And for example, when you read that list of all these people you have to ask, it's all of which there are, there's not like an organized group you can go to. We're just gonna have to survey everybody and say, give us your thinking on this. Then we have complied with asking everybody. Now we formulate a draft plan, 
we we'll probably post it for everyone to comment. We may send it to specific groups, but we're going to post it because that's about the only way you can make sure you meet all the requirements because we don't want to have something kicked back to us and fail to receive funding because we did not, uh, to use your term, we didn't check all the boxes appropriately. Okay. So just to, just to restate, the general public should not, and, and, and us too, should not be reading too much into some of these things that we're required to do in terms of, I believe, at least I know my constituents want to be reassured that we are moving forward. And that's that's really what I want to hear. I, I see no reason that we're not moving forward as we have been. We have moved forward for really since the beginning of school, incrementally and appropriately we've moved forward. But we do have to meet these requirements and we, just, we have to do what we have to do. But to your to your point, uh, people should not read too much into that. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Wales. Thank you. Um, Dr. Royster, I appreciate you're asking us to to provide the the feedback to you on kind of what, what we see. And I certainly, if any of our other board members have already had something in their their head that they think is something we need to fund, I'd, I'd love to hear that myself today if, if they want to share it. Um, one question I have related to that is where are where are we with the facility assessment, the the big district-wide facility yeah. assessments that we started a couple of years ago? Yeah, we we have a meeting later this week. And hopefully coming out of that meeting, uh, we will be able to set a date in August for you all to devote time for a workshop around it. We're that close to it. And it, it's too much to do in a committee at the hall. Okay. It's, it's pretty extensive. So knowing what's in those in that assessment and the kind of things you're going to bring to us, how, how would that, how could that work in those needs influence how we prioritize these funds? I would, I would strongly encourage you to consider using some significant portion of fund balance and or ESSER funding to help with this, because it's going to be pretty extensive. When we start looking at, as you all know, we, we have some aging buildings that weren't in BEST or they were minimally addressed in BEST. Right. And that analysis has further pointed out to us that we're reaching life expectancy on some of those buildings without getting into too much detail about it. They need to be replaced. And quite honestly, some of them don't need to wait until the BEST debt's paid. We need to get a little bit more of a jump start on it and considering the utilization of fund balance for already approved projects and or future to be included projects, I think it would be a very wise use of the fund balance and a wise use of the ESSER funding. Not saying that all of it should go for that purpose, obviously, but I think that would be a wise use and considering they're not recurring funds, would be a good investment on the part of the district to utilize it for those needs. And some of those uh, are regular buildings and some are, uh, some are career centers, for example, uh, which really actually aligns pretty closely with the ESSER requirements, but there, there are other ways to address that. So it, it's gonna be fairly significant. We're looking at the options now. So hopefully we can share with you, well, here's like two options or three for dealing with this facility. Uh, the other thing that will play prominently into that is we're going to bring you a recommendation on site acquisition. So even though the building might be out here, we need to go ahead and do site acquisition because of what's happening all around us. It's always easier to buy a piece of property from one part of Dr. Stiles on 70 acres. We'd rather buy it from Dr. Stiles than have to deal with everybody in the room to buy two acres here and 10 acres here and five acres here and a half acre over here. But that is rapidly disappearing. And the other group that's eager to only deal with one owner are developers for the same reason we only want to deal with one owner. So we, we will likely bring to you 
that'll look a little bit different in the past. We've not been that far ahead on site acquisition, but we need to move to a, a planned site acquisition. Uh, so we got the sites in the inventory when it does become time to build a building. Okay. So you're going to do, uh, in August, you're going to do a workshop with us. Yeah, I think likely late, uh, late August, very first of September. Uh, I kind of got to get a better feel when we meet later this week, to how, how ready we will be for that. Okay. Well, I, I, mean, I know it's taking you a long time to kind of get your arms wrapped around it, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to address those needs. And then. And that was one reason we were extremely eager for them to extend that ESSER 3 deadline. Because one of the things that's happened in this facility study is this question led to this question, which created this answer, which led to this other question. And we want to be, not that we can't go back and amend things later, but we need to be as right about this as we can possibly be because it's going to be a significant investment. Uh, yeah. We want to be real cautious and moving forward. Is, is there anything you could send us in advance, either like the list of the facilities that are most concerned, so that between now and August, if we have an opportunity to, we might be able to send you something like that maybe before the first of August. Let's have to kind of look and see what they've got. Yeah. But, I, not, I mean, maybe not in detail, but just enough for right. us to know what the facilities are that you're most concerned about. Would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Southern. Dr. Oster, I need a clarification. Yes, sir. I was looking here at the extra three allowable activities. Yeah, I was looking at uses of funds. In that first paragraph, down towards the middle part of it, it says here that we need to address the disproportionate proportionate impact of the coronavirus on the Stewart subgroups described in section such and such of the Elementary and Secondary Eight Education Act of 1965. Yes, sir. Uh, what I'm at looking for, what are the subgroups? Are we talking about students experiencing homelessness and children and youth in foster, or is there more included in that? There'll be more in there. The easiest way to kind of summarize it, you know, we, of course, we hadn't done it this year because we didn't do, we didn't have standardized test results from last spring to report. So every year we do that workshop on standardized test results and we show you the gap populations. And those are traditional subgroups within the school that do not perform at the same, that traditionally and nationally don't perform at the same level as other groups. It's basically those subgroups. So part of that has already been addressed when we brought to you the plan that we're using for student remediation and support. That is in part addressed through that plan because it, it's really talking about those subgroups. Well, it's really talking about the students that have not been at the par academically. Yes, sir, and does it, primarily it, the ones in those subgroups, though we're addressing all students that are not performed at the par, but additional emphasis on those in the subgroups. Does it include homelessness? Yes, sir. And does it include youth and foster group? Youth and, yeah, youth and foster care, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mink. Um, just a, a few questions. So this uh, funding and public input, that, that's primarily for ESSER 3 or is it for all of the ESSER funds? Only, only three. Okay, so you've got to create a plan for that, that third allocation of funding. Have we already spent down the other two completely or are there still dollars available in those funds? No, but what is left in the balance, there's about a little over $5 million in ESSER 2 that we'll use to fund our summer programs because you can't start tapping S or three until you get the plan approved. All right, so and we would have money in the general fund, but that ends June the 30th. So from July 1 until the S or three plans approved, we'll use, I think that's $5.7 million probably in S or two. All the rest of S, all the rest of S or one and two we will journal entry expenses from the general fund 
to the ESSER funds. So June the 30th, the only funds remaining in ESSER 1 or 2 would be that $5.7 million. Then you will ultimately have access to that money because it will come part of the general fund fund balance. Because we'd already budgeted for those expenditures in the general fund budget. This, this uh, information that you guys provide us today about allowable expenses is is a little bit more specific than what we saw what we saw before. Is there is there anything that we've already approved in ESSER three that now we're wondering whether it would be allowable or not, or no, we still we still every, forget about the only thing that you've approved in ESSER three goes in that the, it actually goes to meet one of the requirements, which is 20% for remediation support. Okay. So, no, sir, we, you've, you've done nothing that would in any way compromise your funding. I, I may have missed it, but you know, this, this has a lot of restrictions, a lot of expectations about collecting student family feedback to your point, just at a time when students and families are not here. So what is what is the general plan for how we would We're solicit doing that it feedback? Backpack through email, uh, through and and also through that we do have you know obviously some structures so school improvement council and PTAs we'll do it through them but but we'll send a message to every family we'll also post on our website. And, and these messages, we're asking people to do what you asked us to do, which is yeah, make just, recommendations for how these general, funds. What, what do you think this money ought to be used for? No one is limited to these, which is pretty broad, but it's limited to these 15 areas, and it's money that won't recur. That, those are kind of the really the only important points about it. And I, I heard you recommend that, that the board members send requests to you specifically, and yeah, then or, or come by and see me before the board meeting next Tuesday, or send okay. me an email, or call me, or call me. It method doesn't matter. It's possible for us to get just a general summary of those sure. those recommendations, even if they're not ones that you, you choose to make, just so we can understand sure. and maybe help us identify needs that future funding in other buckets may may be available for. Because I know we talked at one point about mental health may not necessarily need to come out of this, but there, there are other dollars that we could use to fund mental health services if we didn't use these dollars. Mr. Mr. Lewis, Lewis, yeah, have, and I think Mr. McCoy needs a few more minutes. Said it. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry, no, I'll just say if you need a few more minutes, I think it's that extend time, but it's good. Are we good to continue with me? Uh, Mr. McCoy, I believe, has said or is setting a meeting with uh, between us and mental health to try to get to the bottom of the issue of what, where is their shortfall, what causes it. Uh, one of the things that, that we did discover, and I think we can help them with this, uh, when a person declines service, they do not track that number or the reason. But we have the ability to do that through the software that we use for on track that's, that we have available in all of our schools. Uh, so we want to better understand their uh, their financial issue. Uh, we know that we've also asked for a copy of because they have a sliding fee schedule based on family income. So we want to get a firm handle on what the numbers are. What are the reasons people decline service? Uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it is stigma. Sometimes it might be for cost. But at this point, they have not had the ability to put a number on either of those things. I can tell you anecdotally that people will turn it down for those reasons. So we're working with them to do, to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, likely we're going to bring you a recommendation that includes funding not just for mental health, but in the advancing of social and emotional learning. Uh, and, and perhaps on many of these things, a lot of the money might be expended on training because you don't ever lose the training. Once you've had the training, you've had the training. So if the dollars go away, uh, so that will likely be, you know, some, some amount of what we recommend. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Next item on the agenda, 3.02, general fund budget update. Excuse me, could I ask one more question for me, please, quickly? Uh, how long do you need? Uh, 38 seconds. <laughs> Extend time for 38 seconds. Okay. Dr. Royster, we've got here the LEA shall use remaining funds in the following ways. And the list 15 of those. Are we going are those 15 going to be taken care of looked at equally, or are we going to have some that be more important than others? I think some will be more important than others because in some cases we we invest considerably in some of those already. Okay, that's all I need. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Well, I think we might have made the 38 seconds too. Yeah, so. It was 36 seconds. Okay. Next item on the agenda, 3.02 general fund budget update. <laughs> Dr. Royster. Thank you, Mr. Meek. I'll, I'll try, to, try to do this fairly quickly. Obviously, you all approved the FY22 general fund budget several weeks ago. And we appreciate your approval of that. That allows uh, Ms. Stack and the people in finance to begin to load the budget to get all the appropriate structures in place, particularly those related to paying the bulk of our employees whose new salary starts July 1 every year. Now, what we lacked going into that was an agreement between the Senate and the House on the budget as it relates to education. And the most significant part of that is the Senate proposed a $1,000 increase to teacher pay across the board. That was not in the House version. It's not in the version we presented to you. The steps are in there. There is no dispute those steps will occur, so it doesn't affect the step increases. It doesn't affect the way you all approved the recommendation we gave, which is to round all those steps to 2%. Doesn't affect all the other employees. This only affects the people paid on the teacher schedule, which in our district are teachers, counselors, media specialists, AAs, because even though they're administrators, they're paid on the teacher scale. They don't receive a supplement for being an AA. And a few other direct instructional people. So there is the possibility between now and the end of the legislature's budget process, which they have extended to June 30th, which is very unusual. It's even more unusual that we don't know very early on that the House and the Senate have said this about the education budget. Once the House has said something and the Senate's said something, Unless they have free conference, which they almost never do, they go, if, if there's a, a difference between the two, it goes to conference committee. But here's what you know for sure. It will not be less than this or more than this. So if there's a difference in the two numbers, as long as we budget for the higher of the two, we're fine. That didn't happen this year. They did not yet to agree because the Senate added this $1,000 based on revenue estimates that the House didn't have. They've now set their calendar. The House is meeting this week. It is not yet on the agenda, which they've only published one day at a time, to address the financial aspect. So this could go on into the week of Jan June the 21st, and it is remotely possible it could go all the way to the end of June. What we think will happen, June the 10th, the Board of Economic Advisors meets again. That is the group at the state level that projects, projects revenue for the legislature. They met last week and they did not revise their revenue projection. There is every reason to believe they will issue a new one on Thursday of this week, the 10th. It might or might not be much improved over the one the Senate had. So now remember, we got the $1,000 increase sitting there. There was some talk that it might, when the House got new budget numbers from the BEA, it might go from $1,000 to $1,500. What we have heard in the last several days makes that seem less likely. But whether it's 1,000 or it's 1,500, we would want you to amend your FY22 budget. Now, you know, that could theoretically wait until later on. But we want, as soon as they make that decision, we want to get you to basically confirm that because we really don't have a choice because it's going to be required 
but you have to amend your budget to confirm that and confirm the amount. Because we want to immediately be able to say to teachers, if our current starting pay is right at 41.5, if it's going to jump to 42.5, we're out there hiring teachers right now. We want to be able to say, we're going to be able to pay you 42.5 if that's what it's going to be. And there are a handful of people. Now, not in the grand scheme of 5,800 plus teachers. It's not a large number. But there's some of them that will start getting their pay, their due pay in July. Counselors and AAs because they work extra days. As a reminder, if you're a teacher in our district, and this would be true in probably every district, the money they get in the summer all the way up until August is money they've already earned. So they're, they're getting paid this year's pay up until the But in August, we've got to be prepared to pay them whatever the new rate is. And that handful of them, again, a handful is several people, but compared to the 5,800, they wouldn't even be prepared to pay them in July. But most importantly, we need to get the budget finalized, get it loaded in, and ultimately the most important thing, to be able to say to teachers, we're going to pay you this much next year, but we're trying to attract teachers in school, and we'll be throughout the summer. So I said all that to say this, as much as we would not like to Im further impose on you. We will likely have to ask you to come back for a special call meeting. We would hope to be able to firmly set this maybe after Thursday, but I would ask you to tentatively plan on Monday, which would be Monday the 20th. So what is that Monday? The week of the 29th, 30th, the 27th. Does that sound right? The, the 20, the 28th. That, There's Monday the 21st that, and Monday the 28th. All right, well, I don't think we're going to know about the 21st. So likely Monday the 28th. It might be possible to do it the Thursday before, but a lot of people like to perhaps make that a long weekend or not. But hopefully we would know either that Thursday or the following Monday. And as soon as we have a good a good feel for that, we will send that information to you. Okay. Uh, unless you all would object to that, we would ask the chair for the special call meeting to be uh, a day, day meeting. And it, it should not be a very lengthy meeting because it basically would be simply asking you to approve the amended budget to recognize that teacher pay increase. And there will be some difference between what they send us and what it cost us. And we probably will have to estimate that amount because if they don't act on the budget until that late in June, it took, and I don't know, we still have a final number. We still don't have a final number on what their first version was supposed to send us. So we may have to ask you for a worst case scenario funded from fund balance, knowing we're going to get some additional revenue. Because I think $1,000 on every teacher's pay is a total of 7.5 million revenue. So worst case scenario, it costs 7.5 million dollars. We know we'll get some amount of that, but we would probably ask you just to be on the safe side to approve up to 7.5 million in fund balance utilization if it's needed, because it always looks better to our bond credit raters that we have made the commitment ahead of the need. Then you can go back later and reduce the commitment when we see we don't need that one. So that, that's sort of my summary of where we are. And I'm sorry, I don't have any better specific information to give you because we just don't have better specific information. So certainly, Mr. Meek, take any questions that people might have. Thank you. Mr. Sailors. Uh, a logistical question, Dr. Royster. With the governor lifting, not extending the state of emergency, how does that change our ability to meet remotely. So for example, the few days that you mentioned, decidedly I can't. Can I zoom in? I'll defer to Mr. Webb's legal opinion. I would need to go back and review, but my, my belief is, Mr. Sailors, that the the motion that waived that policy um, was contingent on there being a state of emergency. So when that was lifted, then the that, that, motion that motion went away. 
Could you confirm that as well? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's just a day meeting. We're only going to be here for about 30 to 30 minutes. That's great. I, I will confirm and, and send that to the board. If that if that might also be helpful to board members, we'd certainly be happy to schedule it as early in the day as as possible. If that's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Dillon? In addition to the teacher raises, I also read that. Um, they were, they're discussing a requirement for police officers to be in every school, not just middle school and high school. And I wondered if that might also affect things for our budget if we need. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of the specifics of that requirement, but we have police officers that serve every school. They're serving every school. And I know they're resource officers, but I, I was under the impression they're not always at the elementary school because they may be patrolling or right. They, they have to have a pay of police officer to be at every elementary school full time. Would that change our budget? It certainly would if, if that in fact is a requirement. I'm not familiar. Uh, I've not seen that proviso. You, you've been informed that was a proviso. I read that it was in the same article with the teacher raises. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, as far as a requirement for every school. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Hearing none. Next item on the agenda is 3.03, naming a Brick Glen Elementary. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Mr. Beek. You, you have in front of you a recommendation from the administration to name the gym at Brook Glen Elementary School for Cindy Mattis Dehart, who has spent uh, 40 years of service uh, to our district. She spent uh, her, like her, better, her daytime job, the predominance of that was at Brook Glen Elementary as PE teacher uh, and as administrative assistant. And she has also served a number of years quite successfully as the girls basketball coach at Eastside High School. And you will see the supporting documentation from the SIC, from the PTA, and from the principal uh, making the request. And we certainly support and recommend this for your consideration to name the gym at Brooklyn Elementary School, the Cindy Mattis Dehart Gymnasium. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Royster, Mr. Sailors. I'd like to make a motion to approve the naming of the gymnasium at Brook Glen Elementary School for Cindy Mattis DeHart. I'd like to second. We have a motion and we have a second. Any discussion? Ms. Laventus West. I've known Cindy for many, many, many years and I've coached with and against her. And I will tell you that her love of children is phenomenal. She's taught physical education. She served in many capacities and she is probably the longest coaching, I can say female coaching for this district, um, uh, girls basketball at East Side. So I, I think this is a great tribute to her service and, uh, and I think the world of her. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Aries. Thank you, Ms. Wells. I turn it back to you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Me. At this time, I will ask Mr. Mr. Suddeth to chair Building and Grounds 4.01. Thank you. 4.01 Facilities Project Report. Mr. Carlin. Yes, sir. I don't have anything specific to report, but I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have on the, uh, the facilities update. Anybody have a question? Mr. Lewis? Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Mr. Carlin, now that we've approved the firm to help design the new work at the new elementary school, it's going to go on the old jail man property. What's what's the general timeline for when that when that work should be completed? Uh, I believe we're projecting 2024 on that one. The school to be completed. Right. The, the, the design work, like how, like what's, what's the general timeline for the firm to 
to design that kind of first version of what it, it could entail. Um, I would need to, I would need to get back with you on that, but I, but I would suspect hopefully sometime in the, in the fall, we'd have a, some type of concept fall of 2021. Okay. Is there an expectation that that firm solicits public input before they bring us a concept or what, what role does the public have in influencing the, that work? Yeah, they're definitely, we'll, we'll take input from, from all the interested parties um before we bring you something to make sure that that's incorporated the, the other the other question i had about that property is it's it's a unique property in that it is currently being used by the high school as athletic fields that we didn't build at the new jail man site so it, it, right. is there an is there an expectation that this firm is going to somehow keep into consideration all of those field spaces as part of this design work or in in what way we, could that could that affect the school to deliver athletics? Well, the intent is not to in, infringe on any of those existing athletic fields, and we would be our sir. There's, there's two different parts to this. Mr. Carlin may not be familiar with Mr. Okay. Lewis. There are the established athletic fields that were left on the whole site which would be softball, baseball, football, and a practice area. JL Mann asked a few years ago if they might utilize the space designated for the new elementary school as a practice area until the school was built. And they were told they could do so with the understanding that when the school was built, the footprint of the school would cover that practice area. So if we can provide them some additional uh, practice facility on that site, we will do so. But I want to make sure we properly answer that question because that was never part of the plan to set aside, if you recall, where the old school physically set, that would be the that will be the site of the new school. So we did allow them to use it, and that was the understanding with the athletic department, with the school, and with the booster club at that time. So can, can we do that again? So football softball and what else baseball it will not impede any of those those are structures that have been built and this will not reduce those no, sizes no, sir, it will not there are other spaces on that property that are currently just being used because they aren't being used by anything else and you're saying those may be the, eliminated the, reduced in, but in fact the one where they're using as a practice field that would be the part of the property that is physically closest to the new jail man. That was the actual site of the old school. Okay. And that will be the site of the new building. So they've been accustomed to using that, but they understood that it would go away. So I want to make sure before we answer that, we didn't somehow send out information that wasn't accurate yep. to the public. Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's great. Cause that, that was, that was the confusion I was getting. Was, I, I had heard from boosters that, their field space was being taken away, but it's it's this temporary space they've been using as field space. It's not the baseball field, softball field, or the football stadium that, that are being that taken. That is correct. Yes, sir. And so our plan would be possibly by the fall of this year to see kind of a preliminary vision of how all that could be reconciled. Well, it, it, we'll, we'll discuss that certainly with Dr. Royster and, and come up with the right time to uh, to bring you that, but. And we don't, but we don't expect the school to actually be in use until fall of 2024. Right. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Wilde. We can't. Go ahead. Ms. Carlin, uh, Fountain and High School were showing completion of July 2021. Is that July 31st? Is that July 1st? Are they going to, are they going to, are they out of the way enough that Staff's going to be able to get in there, and they're going to be able to have students in early. Do you know? Well, the the technical um, completion date is the eighth of July. Um, we we anticipate having furniture arriving and starting to be installed on the nineteenth. We've got uh, final inspections happening at the end of this month, so we will definitely uh, have staff in there in July to start uh, operating and getting getting everything in place the way it needs to be. Okay. And, and the out the exterior, the fields, 
I haven't been out there in the last month or so. so. Really coming together. I was out last week with uh, with Je with Mr. Jeff Knotts checking the status, and they were placing the uh, the concrete uh, walks around the athletic areas. So uh, it's definitely it's definitely coming to a to a completion. We're looking at about ninety five percent on that school right now. Okay, and then related to that, um, thinking about so if we have students walking, biking to get there. Do we have some clear patterns for mobility, you know, pedestrian and bike mobility for kids to get to school that we know are safe? And have we kind of paid, paid close attention to that? I know early on we were coordinating with Greenwood County, um, with Ty Houck on trying to get some connectivity for their the trail system that in the immediate vicinity of the school that we feel like we've got sufficient sidewalks and pathways to get people, kids to and from school. Yes, ma'am, there certainly should be. And we've got, of course, the separation between where, you know, um, uh, the entrances for bus, car traffic, uh, student student lot, those kinds of things. And I, I believe Ms. Tiller is, you know, looking at that actively uh, to make sure there's some clear direction on um, how students and staff and parents, you know, will access and enter, enter the building. Okay, I'll get out there and take a look. Thank you. Please. The next one is you have a question? Yes, sir. I'm afraid to move on. One question, Mr. Collins. Yes, sir. On the Jay Harley Bonds, the main interest upgrade, what does that include? Um, it'll include a secure access to the building, uh, to the to the areas of the building that they'll be operating in, as well as dressing up the outward appearance of it. Will it include the office? Well, what is the main office? I'm, I'm not aware of any direct work we have going on in the main office now. Well, then, uh, what are we going to upgrade there? The, the, the outward appearance as well as the passive. Yeah, we're we're the looking past. just the outside, nothing on the inside. No, it'll be both. Uh, will that be in the hallway, outside uh, the auditorium? Not no, not in, not on that side of the building. It'll be getting access to the stairwell and the corridors leading to these areas. Where are we going to move to the main science lab? I believe the mechatronics lab is on the first floor. We've got some other areas that are being upgraded on the second floor to include cosmetology. So it's going to be able to say the floor. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. We'll go to 4.02, the Duke Energy Carolinas, Eastman of Robert E. Cashin Elementary School. Mr. Chair. Mr. Carlin. Oh. If, if, no. if I might, Mr. Sutton. Uh, yes, sir. If you have in front of you an easement, there is an unusual note about this. <coughs> Where the original intent was the easement for the addition to Robert E. Cash. In our research, we found that you had not approved the original easement for uh, uh, utilities to Robert E. Cash when it was constructed and occupied in 2003. It's 2003, sir. Yes, sir. 2003. So we need to clean that up now. I don't, uh, you know, there, there's probably some legal argument Doug would propose that they got that line in the ground and they've had it there for for that long. It's probably we, we probably we probably de facto grounded them with easement, but we did find that. So we need to we need to clean that up. So we bring to you today request your approval for the original easement for utilities to Robert E. Cashin and a new easement for the addition to Robert E. Cash. Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Webb or, or Mr. Carlin could answer any questions I have about the specifics. Any questions? Michelle, that's you. Mr. Chair, okay. I would like to make the recommended motion to approve the utility easement as requested by Duke Energy Carolinas LLC at Robert E. Cash in the elementary school. We have a motion, we have a second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, likewise. Motion passes. Thank you so much, Mr. Suddeth, for chairing that section. We are very appreciative. We scheduled this to end at 11, 11.05, and we didn't miss it by much. Uh, I'd like to make sure that um, you're reminded, if you're serving on the Roper Mountain P Policy Committee, that immediately following this meeting, you will have your uh, committee meeting. Any questions before we adjourn? Well, no, Chair, one, one, one thing I'd like to get us to 11.05. Uh, uh, to follow up to Ms. Doolin's question, uh, Ms. Horton has informed me that the proviso, as she reads it, that's out there right now is simply some new funding to provide additional SROs with the ultimate goal being to provide SROs in all schools. There's also another proviso about providing financial assistance uh, to school districts uh, to hire additional SROs. She does not find a requirement for, for one of these schools. Doesn't mean there's not a there's you know there's hundreds of provisos floating around out there, so we're we're trying to track them. So thank you. We get you right to level. Yes, eleven oh five, Mr. Sailors. Madam Chairman, I just want to uh, ask that we take about a five minute break at the conclusion of this meeting, so everyone can get into place for the committee meeting. It's going to be mostly informational uh, gathering. Uh, everyone's welcome to participate. And with that being said, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn. Yes, I also wanted to let everyone know there's a box lunch. Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to thank all of those who attended our graduations and to commend uh, the district and Mr. Royster, Dr. Royster and his staff on a job well done. It was nice to see these graduates walk across the stage and uh, you could see them smiling and receive their diplomas. And it was a it was really a, a very exciting time. At this time, um, all in favor to adjourn, please address 